Question for you. Have you ever heard an atheist arguing with someone who believes in God? And the atheist says, well, you believers in God, you got rid of all the other gods. And so I'm just taking it one step further than you and also getting rid of the last God. Have you ever heard an atheist argue this way? Back in the day when the God religion debates were all the rage, this was an argument that the atheists made. And as it turns out, it's actually one of the most tone deaf arguments that any human has ever made. Not because they're wrong per se, but because they don't realize in the way that they are right. And if they realized the way in which they were right, they may not may make that argument. For then, after making that argument, they would have to conclude that they themselves, as atheists, are the unwitting and unconscious product of the Christianity that they claim to reject. Once Nietzsche pointed out how wasn't it funny how so many people lose their faith in God and then they become atheist and that it never dawns on them that when they lose faith in God that they could believe in other gods or a pantheon or any particular God actually. It never dawns on them that they could do that. The default position is always there is no God. And Nietzsche thought this was kind of funny. And indeed, it is an interesting phenomenon. For, as we can see now, because of historians like Tom Holland, we can see now that they are actually just following a trend that they were set up for a long time ago. Did you know that in the first century, the Christians were called atheists by many of their detractors? Did you know that the Jews, who worshipped, in, in contrast with everyone else, who worshipped just one God, like the Zoroastrians who came before them, were often also considered atheists by those who worshipped the Pantheon? Why were they considered atheists? Because they worshipped a God that no one can see, that they couldn't see. There was no represent, representation of this God in, in the form of idols. All throughout the Old Testament, it's a fascinating exercise to, to read through the Old Testament and see the same themes coming up again and again. And to see the Jews struggling, the, the Israelites struggling with their one God over and over and over again. And constantly resisting the impulse to worship gods that they could make, gods that they could represent, with altars made of stone, made of rock, made of marble even. The temptation to do that was ever present all the time. Indeed, the cultures that weren't Zoroastrian or Jewish thought that this was the most natural thing in the world. And indeed, when Rome seemed to be on the decline, at least one emperor tried to avert the decline of the Roman Empire by reestablishing the supremacy of the gods and giving them their proper place. That is, a more prevalent position in the eyes of men in order to foster more devotion to those gods. And in, the, in this context where the vast majority of the nations on earth worshipped many gods, the Jews and the Christians were considered quite repulsive. Now, at least the Jews, what they had going for them was that they were an ancient people that far preceded the Romans. And so because of that, they were at least respected, although at the same time disrespected, at the same time looked down upon as a very strange thing. Indeed, they were, they were considered by many to be atheists. And so, when a modern-day atheist says, I'm just taking it one step further than you Christians, 
who just believe in one God and getting rid of the last God in the same way that the Christians rejected all the other gods. The atheist says that in the pretense of uh, being rational. While the atheist doesn't realize that it's actually because of the trend set by Christianity that they are getting rid of the last God. And so modern atheism, by getting rid of this last God, is proving itself to be very Christian in that regard. And this is the honesty or the half-truth and the great deception of the atheists who made this argument long ago. For they could not come to terms, they could not see the forest for the trees. They could not see the fishbowl that, that they as fish were living in. They couldn't see outside of it. They were swimming in the waters of the rationality of 2,000 years of getting rid of the other gods. But, as Nietzsche has shown so clearly, modern atheists get rid of the last god, but they don't get rid of the morality that was formally attached to that one god. Now, atheists often make the argument that they don't need to believe in God in order to be good, in order to be moral. This, was a very, this is a very old argument. It's been around for a long time. But as finally someone like Tom Holland has shown, and as Nietzsche also explained, of course you don't need God to be good. You don't need God to be moral. That's not the issue. The issue, as Tom Holland and Nietzsche have explained, is that your very definition of what good is, the thing in your mind that constitutes being a good person, that is, a moral person, has in fact been determined by the 2,000 years of Christianity before. So prevalent has Christian value judgments been, so successful, so successful has the Christian movement become that it never dawns on people to question basic moral value judgments. As Tom Holland has explained, one of the most basic judgments people make is that it's obvious that humans have something called human rights. That each person is endowed with dignity, that they deserve to live, and that they ought to be, their right to live ought to be protected. Of course, Nietzsche, with his penetrating eyes, could see through the nonsense of this position. And he could see the source of it, the source of that belief, which in his view came from the Christian notion, or that is the Jewish notion, that men were created in the image of God. And because of this, particularly in Christianity, there was a doctrine of the equality of souls that St. Paul teached very passionately. He said, in Christ, we are all one. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile, Greek, Roman, man or woman. And Nietzsche saw that in this was the seed for what would eventually pass into modernity, into our democratic, so-called democratic age, something called human rights, that we are all equal. And so atheists get rid of the last God but what they don't see is that they're holding on to the morality that came before. That they're holding on to the morality that was attached to the religion and to the God, which they now, in keeping with the trend line of 2,000 years, have rejected. And so because of this, Nietzsche foresaw a great calamity coming to the world. And the rush to what he called grand politics. And indeed, that is what we have seen, and what we are still seeing. Particularly, the rise of communism, which, in its pretense at least, and it is indeed the pretense which is Christian, the pretense, that is, 
the common man, the worker. Concern for people, communism, being communal, as St. Paul said, which would have, by the way, deeply offended all the Romans and Persians and Greeks at the time that Paul said it, which was, you ought to consider others more important than yourself. For so long, atheists have argued about the question, and Christians and Jews and all sorts of religions have argued about the existence of gods, not realizing that the question of the literal existence of literal deities, that the very concern itself about that question is in itself created by the Christianity which they now reject. Why? Because Jesus enshrined truth, seeking truth and truthfulness. He stood before Pilate and said, those who listen to the truth listen to Jesus. And of course, Pilate, in his characteristically Roman sentiment, looked at him and said, Quid e veritas? That is, what is truth? And in this question, this rhetorical question in response to Jesus' words, what is truth? He was echoing the sentiment that was common in the non-Christian world, which is that the pursuit of truth is rarely a primary task. For the Romans, as it was for many, the pursuit of glory, the pursuit of valor, the pursuit of even ascendance to godhood, far outweighed truth and seeking truth. And so now we have in our world, 2,000 years later, after Christianity has triumphed, and this sentiment of Jesus that seeking truth is good, now we have managed to create a whole bunch of atheists who claim truth as their highest prerogative. And they all think that it's always been that way, or rather, that they are some sort of new level of uh, new advancement of humanity because they seek truth. When in reality, the values of the ancient world were quite different. Glory was the main pursuit. Almost all other cultures pursued glory and power over truth. And so what of this desire for truthfulness, which, as Nietzsche had explained, eventually led to this atheism, this very concern about the question of if gods exist or not, or if God exists. It strikes us as strange that there was a time where the question of the truthfulness of the actual literal existence of deities was completely and utterly beside the point. It strikes us as odd to think that way. How could that be? How could that never occur to them? But indeed, as scholarship is showing more and more, the existence of the God was no less true than the existence of the sun, the moon, the trees, the air, and the ground on which he walked. And this absolute pursuit of absolute truth, probably to many of them, would have come across as weakness and even a dis sort of disability. But here we are, 2,000 years later, following the trend line of truthfulness set up by the Zoroastrians and set up by the Jews and by Jesus, who enshrined truth by saying, when his disciples asked him, what, what is the truth? He said, I am the truth. By personally identifying himself as the truth, he enshrined it on a level that's never been enshrined ever before. And we have been living in the afterglow of this for, the, for 2,000 years. People like to think that history started at the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment's commitment to truth. 
when in fact it happened a long time ago. It is hard for people to imagine such a world, such a time, when people just weren't that obsessively, compulsively driven to know the truth of the world. But indeed, there was such a time. And for Nietzsche, that time was more innocent than in our time, even in its brutality. But 2,000 years of truth valorization eventually led to the Enlightenment. And then, after the Enlightenment, led to atheism. And then, after that, it led to Nietzsche, who honestly reflected back on this religion and said, well, if there is no God, then there's no such thing as morality. So we must dispose with the pretense that we ought to love one another, that we ought to, as St. Paul said, consider others more important than ourselves. And in this regard, Nietzsche was honest. In this regard, Nietzsche actually did pursue the truth. And it is in this regard that all, almost all of Nietzsche's contemporaries, whether, whether people who would become fascist, or whether people who would become communist, or whether people who would become democratic, could not follow Nietzsche's honesty. They could not follow him there. And so what, what happened? Well, with the communists, they were subconsciously, they got rid of the God of the Christian faith that preceded them, that they grew out of for 2,000 years. But they could not shake off the pretense of the valorization, valorization of St. Paul, who said, you ought to love your neighbor. You ought to consider your neighbor more important than yourself. This morality, without the God associated with it, when kept, leads to communism. And hence, you have people like Karl Marx, who, being the tormented, noxious blend of Jew, German, and Protestant, was full of self-loathing and created out of, unconsciously out of, the Christianity that came before him, the most noxious idea that has ever existed before in human history, and which now th still threatens the future of the human race via globalism, via transhumanism. For the ethic that demands that you consider others more important yourself will always, eventually, especially in an age like ours, where we can constantly be aware of the suffering of now billions of people around the world, lead to exhaustion. For it is simply not possible to, quote, love your neighbor all the time in a world where your neighbor is literally everyone in the world. This, I think, Nietzsche would have seen as a shortcoming of Jesus' teachings. Or maybe he would have seen a little better honesty in Jesus when he talked about the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. For what is one of the key takeaways of that parable? Well, aside from the shocking notion that you should love your neighbor, whoever is around you, the parable, at least, limited itself to proximity. That is, if you see someone suffering, no matter who it is, even if it's a Samaritan, even if it's someone who's a non-Samaritan, you should help them out. At least in that case, it was just people that you could see in your pro physical proximity. However, because of the technological age in which we live, now we can see everyone suffering all the time. This must, if we keep this ethic, lead to, eventually, emotional 
spiritual, religious, and cultural exhaustion. Aside from the also, aside also from the fact that there are so many broken people who relentlessly, who relentlessly take advantage of others who genuinely care about others, those people would be, would be considered to have personality disorders. Aside from those people who do, in fact, relentlessly exploit so-called compassion, even if that were not the case, and it is, but even if it were not the case, still, the amount of suffering in the world, just by virtue of how much there is that we can be aware of, leads to, if we follow this ethic of considering others more important than ourselves, it must lead to total societal exhaustion and collapse. And it must eventually lead to the desire to kill off the human race entirely. As Nietzsche said, a time will come when we will need new values. As I've explained already, the Germans, when they elected the Fuhrer, they were attempting subconsciously to throw off the morality of St. Paul. They were attempting to. However, because the Fuhrer himself was, unlike Nietzsche, unable to level with his people about the need to throw off the morality of both St. Paul and Jesus of Nazareth, allowed his people, in order to get elected, because he was democratically elected, allowed his people to maintain the obscene incongruence of believing in fascism and yet paying also lip service to the Th hundreds and thousands of years of Protestant Christianity that came before. The Third Reich was more honest than the communists, more sincere in their fascism to throw off Christian morality by disposing of the pretense of caring about people outside of their own race. They were more honest and in that sense more virtuous than the communists. They were, however, though, as no doubt Nietzsche would have said if he had been alive to witness it, that the Third Reich was unable to level with their own people about the need to be consistent, and that if they weren't going to be Christians, they needed also to get rid of the morality of, of Christianity. But German fascism, was a greater attempt to throw off Christian morality while communism did not even try. That is, in its pretense, in pretending to care about the worker. The communist was being thoroughly Christian. The communist, at least on the surface, at least in lip service, could not have the courage of the fascists to dispose of the morality of St. Paul, which was, as I've already said, to consider others more important than yourself. Thus, the disaster of communism and the disaster of fascism around the world was and even now, the disaster of capitalism and democracy is all, to varying degrees, movements that have arisen in the afterglow of 2,000 years of a new morality that generally, on the whole, before then, simply did not exist. And for Nietzsche, it was the incongruency, it was the disparity between getting rid of the, the deity but keeping the morality, which I believe he saw as one of the greatest, if not the greatest danger for the future 
of the human race. And hence why he said, a time will come when we will need new values. Where we won't go back necessarily, we won't go back to the Roman ideology, we won't go back to the Greek, or to the Zoroastrian, to the Jew, to the Christian, to anything that has come before, but rather, a time would come after this calamity of grand politics, which sprung out of the death of God, people getting rid of God but holding on to the morality, a time would come eventually where humans would finally be able to take on, to create new values. And if this time ever came where humans were to do this, it seems to me that this time of new values would, quite paradoxically, not be a contradiction of the previous religions that came before, like Christianity, but rather their fulfillment. For in Nietzsche being honest about the need for new values, he was, as he claimed, coming full circle on the problem of morality. And in his truthfulness to under and in his desire and in his desire to understand it and establish the truth of the way to go, he was in fact being a sort of end times prophet of the very faith that he now repudiated. For the last couple hundred years or so, the majority of men have not had the courage to admit the problem of values. Even I myself, growing up, when people had debates, when they argued on the internet or in person, the debate was always about questions of what was literally true. Few had the courage to have the debate about values. But in hindsight now, indeed, such people could not do that. For to do that would require a historical perspective that has only recently become, has only recently been becoming more widely available. This has been video number three of four. The next video, video four of four, will be all about these new values. Thank you.